Hello, I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary readings. This week, we are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 2 to 16. Before we get started, let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we get ready to enter into your word, Lord, guide us into a deeper understanding of what this passage means. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we take a look at divorce and what Jesus has to say about divorce. And our commentary today comes from uh, Matt Skinner in 2018. So let's take a look at marriage, divorce, and family. Mark's original readers probably found Jesus's uncompromising statements about divorce and remarriage as challenging and countercultural as we do today. In 2020, almost 50% of all marriages in the United States will end in divorce or separation. Researchers estimate that 41% of all first marriages end in divorce. Depending upon your sources, some say divorce rate is as high as 60%. So marriages today have a 40% chance of success. With all of that said, let's look at our reading for today. I hope you have your Bibles open and ready. We are in Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 16. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. So let's take a look at some of the background and what divorce meant in the first century world. Divorce in the first century was a generally a accepted part of life, both among Jews and perhaps more so within wider Greco-Roman culture. Some writers and public leaders spoke against divorce as bad for society, but for the most part, people debated only details of its legal basis. Among Jewish legal experts, Deuteronomy 24, 1-4 was a key text, one that assumes divorce will occur and prescribes procedures for carrying it out. But other scriptures called the permissibility of divorce into question. See Malachi 2, 13 to 16, or Genesis 2, 24. But what is really happening here, and, and what so often seemed to happen between the Pharisees and Jesus, is this was kind of a test question. The Pharisees were looking to see how Jesus was going to interpret this law, and instead they found a harsher interpretation from him than, I think, what they were hoping for. The Pharisees who asked Jesus about divorce do so to test him. The scene through 10.9 therefore proceeds as a confrontation in which Jesus shows the Pharisees to have misunderstood scripture. More precisely, they misunderstand God's design and misuse scripture and interpretive traditions to justify their errors. As for the Pharisees' intentions, they might hope their question will expose Jesus as dangerous to families, in light of his scandalous comments in 3.31-35. Jesus turns the conversation with the Pharisees away from the legal foundation for divorce to God's design for marriage. That is, he dismisses the law, Deuteronomy 24, 1-4, as a concession to human weakness and offers a different perspective rooted in creation, quoting Genesis 1, and 2, His brief argument describes marriage as a strong and literally unifying bond between two people. It is because he sees marriage in such a way that he speaks against divorce as he does. So what exactly does Jesus say about it? Technically speaking, Jesus implies that he disapproves of divorce. More plainly, he says that divorce 
contravenes God's design as expressed in Genesis 1 and 2. Later, with his disciples, he reveals more specifics, saying that a person who initiates a divorce to marry another person commits adultery. In all of this, Jesus radicalizes the demands of Scripture to point perhaps far beyond where any Pharisee would have taken it. To explore the meaning of this passage, we need to consider how Jesus makes his case and what he aims to accomplish by it. So let's go a little bit deeper into this. Jesus does not say what he does because he has a thing against the Mosaic Law. Far from it. Details of the text and the cultural context shed light on the purpose and assumptions of his argument. In 10.4, the Pharisees paraphrase Deuteronomy 24, 1-4, which permits a man to divorce his wife if he finds something objectionable about her. First, this reminds us that this portion of the law, like the official legal debates among Jesus' contemporaries, presupposes a man's point of view. Second, a well-known debate focused on those verses, with the scribal school of Hillel taking them to allow divorce for any reason, and the school of Shammai taking them to allow divorce only in the case of adultery. Jesus shows no interest in being drawn into that debate, nor does he proceed by assuming a husband's prerogatives in the matter. Marriage in the ancient world, at least among the vast majority of social strata, was primarily a means of ensuring families' economic stability and social privileges by creating both offspring and interfamily alliances. A woman's sexuality was essentially the property of her father, then of her husband. The Pharisees neglect to mention a key piece of Deuteronomy 24, 1-4, which requires a husband to give the certificate of divorce to his ex-wife. Such a document might provide a divorced woman with a defense against rumor and slander. For a majority of women in that culture, survival depended upon being a member of a household, a woman, perhaps with children, without a husband and without a means of explaining why she was unmarried, could be exposed to great risk. The law's provision about the certificate seeks to mitigate that risk, but apparently the Pharisees find that detail not worth noting. When Jesus talks with his disciples in 10.10 to 10.12, he says nothing about the rejected partner in a divorce and his or her remarriage. He seems to be speaking specifically against those who leave their partners for others. His point is that divorce does not offer a legal loophole to justify adultery. That is, his strongest words are against those who initiate divorce as a means to get something else, sacrificing a spouse to satisfy one's desires or ambitions. In Mark chapter 10, 10 through 12, Jesus gives women a place of greater equality in the marriage relationship, hardly seeing them as passive objects. For one thing, the prohibition of 10, 12 concerning women who divorce their husbands parallels 10, 11. And Matthew's gospel confirms the scandalous nature of such a suggestion. It omits it. You can see Matthew 19, 9 for that. Second, by speaking of a man committing adultery against a woman and not against her father or her past or present husband, Jesus implies that adultery involves more than violating the property rights of another man. It concerns accountability to a partner, just as marriage does. If we look to these details, we can highlight the cultural differences between us and the Gospels to be sure. Certainly today, at least in the industrialized cultures, marriage has changed greatly being less about economics and more about people seeking mutual fulfillment. And while divorce still often leads people, especially women, into financial hardship, divorced women today do not always find themselves doomed to the same social jeopardy many of their ancient counterparts faced. But these points do not render this passage irrelevant. Rather, the cultural and textual particularities cast light on how Jesus' teachings might protect women of his time from men who use divorce for their own benefit and so imperil women. This is hardly the only place where Jesus says that God's design means to provide wholeness and protection for those who are vulnerable. It is no co coincidence that Mark tells a story about Jesus blessing children. Children in the ancient world had few rights and essentially no social status. Therefore, the disciples obstruct people who bring children to Jesus. Jesus blesses them, not because they conjure sweet images of cherub cherubic innocence, but because he has concern for the vulnerable and scorned, those 
ripe for exploitation. Jesus describes marriage with utmost seriousness as something that transcends contractual obligations and economic utility, as something rooted in human identity. This offers a sharp reproof to anyone who, cons who would construe marriage as a contract of convenience, casually formed and casually broken. It impels churches to promote and foster healthy marriages, and in the case of divorce and remarriage, to extend compassion and facilitate healing. So I have just a few questions for you to think about today as uh, we entered into this difficult passage of divorce. Um, I believe divorce has affected all of us, whether we have actually been divorced or not. We have friends who have gone through it. My family has gone through it. Um, so it, it affects all of us. It affects all of the family. And I think that we often uh, negate how difficult it is to navigate through a divorce because of the relationships that have been formed. So I just have a question, a couple questions for you. How has divorce affected you and how you view relationships between husbands and wives? Whether you have been through a divorce, were a child of parents who divorced, or have had family or friends that have divorced, how have you seen reconciliation? Jesus in our reading today points out how women and children need to be taken care of in divorce, as that was a cultural issue in the first century world. Do you feel that this is an issue in our 21st century? Do women have a more difficult time than men in recovering from a divorce? Just a few things as you go about your week to think about. I pray that as you uh, go back to the gospel and read it this week, that God guides you and uh, that God enlightens you. May you have a blessed week.